Coming up on this episode... This is what I love doing and this is what I've always wanted to do. When I changed my way of thinking about it and I brought that business mindset into my writing, a lot of things clicked into place. For example, that not all money I spent was an expense, but a lot of it was an investment in the future and the things that would come back to me. It became apparent to me that this could be a good way of reaching a wide audience. And I love the idea that you can put small amounts of money in, you can test, the data comes back, the spreadsheets everywhere, I'm in heaven. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 115 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Adam Croft. With almost 2 million books sold to date, Adam Croft is one of the most successful independently published authors in the world and one of the biggest selling authors of the past few years, having sold books in over 120 different countries. His 2015 worldwide bestseller, Her Last Tomorrow, became one of the best selling books of the year, peaking at number 12 in the combined paperback fiction and nonfiction chart. Adam lives in the UK with his wife and their child and continues to write fiction, co hosts the Partners in Crime podcast with Robert Dawes, and writes books and creates courses to help other authors. It's a fantastic interview. You're going to have a really fun time listening to Adam, and I've already teased you the opening of this, some of which you're going to get in that. But before we go there, let's first hear a word from this episode's sponsor, Find Away Voices. <music> This is a tip from Findaway Voices based on a Findaway blog article from Tani Andreos from the Findaway team. You've lined up your new book launch, your promo with new in books and BookBob are set to drive big volume, you have your email list segmented, you have blog posts and newsletters drafted and scheduled, you've teased chapters, created trailers, A-B tested Facebook ads, posted a few fun Instagram stories, the dollars are rolling in thanks to the fantastic pre-sale price that you have offered excitement for your new release reaches an all-time high and you see huge success with your book congratulations and then 10 weeks later you release the audiobook did you know that simultaneously releasing your audiobook with your ebook and your print book is a huge sales driver it also sets you up as more professional because you're releasing it the way the big publishers do and you're standing above the crowd in that way well here are some ways to make that happen the simultaneous release and warning it does take planning and patience one communicate with your producer or narrator make sure you talk to them right away about your ebook launch and the timing so you can get that in place number two consider delaying your release i know it takes sitting on it after working on the book and, and and then you have to work with a narrator and the producer to get it done but but remember it does set you apart and allows those who want to buy the more expensive audiobook or or use a token for it on some of the sites to get that version when it's first released so when you see a boost with the ebook sales you could also see a boost in those early days with the audiobook number three cast your narrator early similarly to planning ahead it's it's part of that planning ahead and and getting that into play maybe considering casting your narrator as you're in the editing process of the book as well so you can be starting that process in parallel and number four remember and plan on the audiobook distribution time so an ebook is usually you know 12 to 48 to 72 hours to get into the retail sites but it can typically take one to three weeks for the audiobook to be pushed out so consider building that into your plan. Now those are just some of the tips from the Find Away Voices blog, from the Find Away Voices team on helping you with strategizing. But if you're looking for support and help on your audiobook for either doing it yourself or working with Find Away Voices to find a professional narrator, do make sure you check out Find Away Voices over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. 
And now it's time to get to your comments. Thank you, everyone, for your comments on episode 113. And a reminder, I'm going to talk about this at the end of this comment section, there is a chance you still have until January 31st to leave a comment on episode 113 for a chance to win a prize. Awesome. Amy Tessicata said, love the variety of answers given on some excellent questions. And Amy was talking about episode 113, which was the episode on productivity. It was the panel discussion with four amazing guests. Amy also said that her favorite productivity tool is the Kanban board. She says, I started to use it last quarter and it was nice to see all the finished, in quotes, at the end of the three months. Thank you, Amy. Kanban? Kanban? Did I pronounce that right? I actually haven't heard of that, or, or, or have I, and I just forgot about it. Well, in any case, I just looked it up, and it appears to be a scheduling or a workflow management process that allows you to visualize, and, and it seems designed uh, for lean operations, or at least that's my quick one-minute understanding of it. Uh, it looks like it's produced from Asana, which I have used in the past and I really admire. So thank you, Amy, for that. I'm going to have to check it out in more detail and that's a useful tool for me. Perhaps it's a useful tool for other people out there. Carol Bejean said, like some of the guests, wait, I have to pause. So Carol, I hope I got that right because I am French, the last name Lefebvre. Did I actually get your name correct? Okay, cool. I just want to make sure. If I got it wrong, you can slap me in the head next time I see you. Anyways, Caro said, like some of the guests said, writing down my to-do lists daily, weekly, monthly, annual with physical pen and paper seems to be more effective in helping me be more productive. I'm guilty of moving my self-assigned tasks on my electronic calendar all the time. Oh God, Caro, tell me about it. Um, Caro also says, when I write my daily tasks down on a tiny post-it, I tend to get a lot more done. The trick for me was to reduce the size of my piece of paper so I wouldn't be tempted to list too many things, which ended up discouraging me every night as I never got them all done. That is a brilliant idea, Carol. I really, really like that. I love the the tiny post-it note. I mean, writing it down is true. There's, there's a different part of your brain that works, isn't it, when you actually physically write something down? But I love the idea of using a small sticky note because it keeps it manageable. It's not like this giant whiteboard and giant list that you're not going to get to, but it's small enough that you have to keep it concise, keep it manageable. Great idea. Thank you so much for sharing that. Stanley B. Trice said, Thanks, Mark, for your podcast. I enjoyed the panel discussion you had for this podcast. It helped me to think about my productivity. I try to keep productive by tracking the amount of time I spend, either creating, editing, or filing away the rejection notices. Oh, yeah, tell me about that, Stanley. I'm still doing that a lot. Um, as Stanley continues to say, I know some writers keep track of words per day or something similar, my time track at least keeps me motivated. Thanks, Stanley. Time tracking rather than word tracking is useful because then you have accountability for how much time you spend on certain tasks. And I really admire that approach because time, of course, is precious and something we can't manufacture. We can manufacture words. We make up words and sentences. Well, we don't make up words. We make up sentences from words all the time. But time is something you can't manufacture. So understanding how the, how you're spending the time or, or how you're investing the time is critical. So thank you, Stanley. Chad Boyer says, always like the shout out from previous comments. Well, cool. Thanks for that, Chad. I'm glad you enjoy that because... I plan on continuing to do that. You know why? Because I value the comments from this community. I love when you guys take the time. And I know it's hard to take the time to leave the comments. But I want to encourage you reflectives to share your own reflections. For one, for selfish reasons. That way I can learn more. But sometimes just by jotting them down, I know a pen and paper, or just leaving a comment publicly is, uh, you know, that sort of accountability. You're like, hey, this is what I learned. And sometimes sharing the things that you learn are ways that you can learn too. But that's that's just me being selfish. I want you guys to share stuff so I can learn more. So that's really what it is. Um, chat also says, so there was a lot of good data in this one, mainly because these ladies are very productive, which I agree with, of course. That's why I had them on. And he said, uh, I like the idea of four books a year to stay engaged. He says, uh, I'm working on two books a year at this point, but could see 
my using the tips from the episode to get to four, which great, fantastic. Chad also uh, quotes the line, more productive you are, the more productive you are. And he says, this makes sense because you have all your book in your mind's eye if you're consistently working on it. Plus, just like weightlifting, as you hold more of the book in your head, it gets easier the more times you do it. (laughs) Kind of funny, Chad, because I was just at the gym just doing uh, the arms and the upper body kind of work. And it's funny when you said weightlifting, I'm like, how did you know? Uh, Anyways, Chad continues to say, the last two points coincide. Make sure you have a rest day involved. And Friday to Sunday night off like a normal job. He says, since I'm working, I feel like the weekend is usually time for me to get work done on my novels and side business. But break time is good too. No sense in causing burnout and not touching the keyboard to recover. Thanks, Mark. I look forward to hearing about your productivity in 2020. Keep up the awesome podcast. Well, thank you, Chad. And since you are working a day job, the writing time, I understand, is squeezed in during evenings and weekends. I did that for a long, like 20, 30 years. I'm not going to count. But I'm glad you recognize the importance of resting and not burning yourself out. If I can, and it's my podcast, so I guess I can, if I can quote a Rush song, you know, since you listeners know that I'm a huge fan of Rush and Neil Peart, I mean... You know, the last episode, episode 114, if you if you bared with me and listened to that very indulgent episode that I released earlier this week, you know I'm a fan. So here, here are the quotes from the song. You can do a lot in a lifetime if you don't burn out too fast. You can make the most of the distance, but first you need endurance. First, you've got to last. Now that's from the song Marathon, a lyrics, of course, by Neil Peart. But thank you, Chad, because... What you just said there, thinking about rest and not burning yourself out. Well, of course it made me think of a Rush song. So thanks, Chad, for that one. And and come on, thank you guys for humoring me with my constant Rush lyrics. And the last comment from this episode. Roland says, funny, Kevin McLeod does my music too. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that funny? Isn't he great, Roland? I mean, I actually uh, interviewed Kevin McLeod back in episode 11 of this podcast. Wow, the podcast was only 11 weeks old back then when I had Kevin on. And the podcast just celebrated its second birthday, the first week of January. And heck, actually, when I think about it, I used Kevin's music in my very first podcast, which I started in June 2006. That podcast was called Prelude to a Scream. I remember I had released the book One Hand Screaming in 2004. And between June 2006 and May 2011, I created a total of 18 episodes. Isn't that hilarious? Five years, 18 episodes. Wow, that was consistency for you. As opposed to 113 episodes, basically, which is more than one a week uh, that I did in the last two years. And I understand, yeah, it's more than one a week, because kind of like this week, where I snuck in episode 114, because I had to pay tribute to Neil Peart the lyricist and drummer for Rush. But because I cannot resist, because Kevin McLeod is awesome, here's the opening of the podcast, Prelude to a Scream, episode 18, May 31st, 2011. People who haven't died can still leave their spirit in a place, and they spend the rest of their lives searching for something, because they have this empty feeling. They don't know what it is, though. They don't realize that their spirit is still waiting for them at the place where they left it. Silent screams bounce around my head like an impending storm, brewing into a force that will escape in a wild dance of chaos and be lost forever if I don't stop to write them down. Hello, and welcome to episode 18 of Prelude to a Scream, podcast fiction by Mark Leslie. I'm your host, Mark Leslie, and this time around we have something very special. We have a story called Spirits, which has never been published before. It's the first time I'm doing this on the podcast, but it's a long one. It runs about 32 minutes. So without further ado, I'm going to get right to the story, and I'll meet you here at the end for some story notes. Well, wasn't that cool? Well, okay, Kevin's music was cool. I was 
kind of early days of podcasting and I'll be honest with you, I had a pretty crappy, I think it was a $30 mic, not not like the $130 one I have now, but um, couldn't resist sharing that with you, because Kevin's music is just so awesome. So thank you, Roland, for that comment. Now this is just a reminder that if you comment on episode 113 of the podcast, which is the podcast panel discussion on productivity for authors in 2020, 2020 Productivity for authors in 2020. See, I would normally cut that out, um, but I'm leaving that in there for you because I I care about you guys and I want you to see the goof ups and the mistakes that I make, right? Okay, but but just as a reminder, if you comment on episode 113, which is the episode on productivity for authors, you'll get a chance to win a copy of either the hardcover or the paperback version, your choice. What do you want? Hardcover, paperback, it's up to you, of Joanna Penn's Productivity for Authors. Now, all commenters will leave a comment with a reflection of something they learned from the episode or their favorite personal tip for productivity. And if you leave it by the end of day, Eastern Time, Friday, January 31st, 2000, there I did it again, Friday, January 31st, 2020, will be entered in a draw for a chance to win. Now, of course, all patrons of the show, thank you patrons, are automatically entered in that draw so if you're a patron and you leave a comment well then you get two entries for a chance to win joanna penn's book productivity for authors now how cool is that that's cool because my patrons are cool so did you hear that chad and stanley you get entered a second time for once for leaving a comment, once for being one of my amazing team of patrons. So thank you all patrons of the podcast. Thank you all listeners. Thank you all commenters. Uh, thanks for participating. I really appreciate your engagement. If you want to leave a comment, you can go check out comments over at starkreflections.ca. You can comment on episode 113 for a chance to win. You can also listen to the end of this episode where there is another chance to win for commenting on episode 115. Oh boy, that's exciting. And you can also just leave comments for fun and, and frivolity on the podcast over at starkreflections.ca or you can at me at Mark Leslie if you want to just tell me something really cool. That would be awesome. I'm going to skip the personal update for this episode because it's 17 minutes and I haven't even gotten into anything. So let's just jump right into this interview with Adam Croft and I'll catch you on the other side of this interview. <laughs> Hey, Adam, thank you so much for joining me here on the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It is a long time in the making. I mean, uh, we've been trying to schedule. I've been wanting to. I think it's over a year now when we first started saying, oh, my God, I need to have you on the podcast. So thanks for coming. This is exciting that we get to do this. Yeah. No, it's good. Unfortunately, we are, we're both disorganized. Um, yeah, but we right. managed to get there in the end. <laughs> that you had, you know, little people in your life and stuff like that too. So lots yeah, going on. Lots going on. Yeah, yeah. So for anyone who is not familiar with Adam Croft and the, and the amazing things that you've achieved, let's go back to uh, the beginning of your, uh, of getting into writing and publishing. Where did it all start for you? Um, well, I guess I've always written. Um, to some degree, uh, the school that I went to, though, kind of um, beat those things out of us, uh, <laughs> metaphorically, not literally, thankfully. Right. Um, that had been outlawed by the time I got there. Um, but it was very much trying to get you down the business and the science routes and sensible subjects. Um, so it, it was always a bit of a pipe dream for me, really. And I think it was when I was on holiday in 2008, I started getting the idea for the first book and subsequently got that written and didn't quite know what to do with it and towards the end of 2010 I'd started looking at the options I'd seen that um, you could now put books up there yourself on the Kindle which had just been launched in the UK I think the year previous Um, so I thought well this is a great way to put it out there see if it's any good see what people think get some feedback from people who aren't my mum and (laughs) try and find out if it's if this is worth if something worth progressing and it very quickly became apparent that not only um was it something worth progressing but that self-publishing in, pe- publishing independently itself was um potentially something which could be um a very lucrative and very sensible career choice above and beyond the traditional routes that everybody already knew about okay 
So early days of Kindle. Now, what was it that you were publishing? Is it the thrillers that you became known for? Yeah, it was uh, my first crime fiction book, Too Close for okay. Comfort, which is the first Night and Culver House book. And I'm still writing that series now. Um, I've had the ninth book has just come out in that and I'm planning the 10th. Um, so in those days, it was much simpler. Far fewer people were doing it and knew how to do it. Um, so rising above other books was simpler. Okay. Um, most of the time, if you made the book free and just kind of talked about it on, on social media a little bit, then you would probably get into the top 10, if not number one, um, <laughs> which is what happened. And it, um, it kind of gained popularity from there and gained me some readership. And I spent the next five years really floundering about not knowing what to do, how I had done it, uh, how it could be replicated and how I could, um, really capitalize on that. And, Considering the fact that I was writing and releasing books while I was running a small business, it took that long for me to realize that my writing was in itself a small business and wasn't just a hobby and something I did on the side, which I was trying to gear up, but that it itself was an enterprise. And it took me a long time to come to that realization. And very shortly after I did, things began to change. Really? So, um, I mean, at what point you were running the small business and then you were doing the writing uh, stuff and that was about a five year period. How much were you producing as a, as a writer while, while still doing that um, business? It was up and down, really. I think 2011, I had three or four books out. That was my first year. Um, 2012, I don't think I had any. 2013, I had one or two. I think 2014, again, it might have been three or four. So it was very up and down, depending on how... Um, positive or despondent I was feeling so um, <laughs> 2012 I will add um, I did buy a house and get married that year so it's that, a that little busy explain. right okay yeah it was quite, quite a busy <laughs> year so um, I think looking back I was probably putting my time and effort into the things which were actually going to bring in money which was the the proper job at the time <laughs> so um, yeah it, it was very up and down I didn't really know what I was doing I had periods where I was just kind of flying through and bits where I was sitting back and going well this isn't working nothing's happening with it and I think that's a story that probably quite a lot of writers can um, can sympathize with that they've had those times where they're very hopeful very positive very optimistic and after a while when it looks as if there's no movement um you can lose hope quite easily right so i mean not not to skip to that not to not to give away any spoilers but but things changed for you dramatically in a positive way i i'm not sure if you're still running the entrepreneurial business but i do know <laughs> that, that uh, you are successful as a, as a full-time writer but um what was that? What happened? What were the things that happened that led you to, you know, the Adam Croft that I know and love today? Well, I mean, first of all, as soon as the, um, as soon as it did take off and I was earning enough to stop doing anything else, I very quickly stopped doing anything else because <laughs> this is, this is what I love doing and this is what I've always wanted to do. Um, I think when I changed my way of thinking about it and I brought that business mindset into my writing, I, a lot of things clicked into place. Um, for example, that not all money I spent was an expense, but a lot of it was an investment in the future and were things that would come back to me. Um, so I started looking into courses and training and I did Mark Dawson's, uh, I think it was called Facebook ads for authors back then. Um, and it became apparent to me that this could be a good way of reaching a wide audience. And I love the idea that you can put small amounts of money in, you can test, the data comes back, the spreadsheets everywhere, I'm in heaven. <laughs> so I started running some ads, realized that there wasn't quite the movement that I wanted. Um, and it was about catching people's eyes. And my books are, although they are loved, they're mostly not things that you can distill down into a short sentence and catch people's eyes with but I did have a book which I had mostly written probably half two-thirds written didn't quite have the ending nailed um, it wasn't a book which was in a series and everybody said to me always write in a series always you know stick to what you know and um, this is a standalone book um, it was purely going to be something just for the sake of doing it so because it was causing me so many problems I didn't finish it but one thing it did have was um, an attention grabbing and marketable hook, which was, could you murder your wife to save your daughter? And I thought to myself, okay, if this Facebook advertising is going to work, if this is going to be a way of shifting some books, then this is probably the book of mine, which has got the most chance of 
being successful on that front. So I um, got my head down, got it finished and um, put it out there, not expecting too much to happen, started running some ads to it. And it very quickly became apparent that this was something that was grabbing people's attention. And it made me realize that um, the kind of the prime point of advertising really is to grab people's attention is to stop them doing what they're doing, especially when it comes to Facebook, when they're scrolling through, they're not looking to buy books. You need to catch somebody's attention in a way which isn't obnoxious and isn't um, going to annoy them but it's actually going to intrigue them and inspire them to try to find out more. Okay. So um, I, uh, I use that uh, log line example from you uh, with authors that I work with uh, consistently. I always come back, even if they're not writing uh, crime thrillers, I come back to it and I say, you've got to look at her last tomorrow. You've got to look at this. What is it about that log line that catches people attention? And one of the things that I usually say is, what it does is it puts the reader in their own head. Mm. It asks them a question mm. that requires them to go into themselves and think about what they would do in that situation, which is, I mean, one of the most critical things you can do is make the potential reader think about themselves because they are the most interesting thing in the universe, right? Yeah. <laughs> Their answer I mean, to where were you on 9-11? Where were you when this happened? What would you do in this situation? Is that, is that, is that kind of where that comes from? It is, yeah. I mean, there are lots of aspects to it. I mean, I've spent the last five years trying to analyze um, you know, the, the power of those nine words or however many it is seven or nine words <laughs> um, because obviously they changed my life um, they work they've you know, I've, I've done a lot of work since I've got books and courses on how to write blurbs and hooks and things so I had to get to the bottom of what works and and why and of course because I wanted to replicate it and do it again and again <laughs> and again um, and I have done it once or twice since with, with other hooks and I think what made that one work what I will say, first of all, is this is a recipe which is peculiar to psychological thrillers. It doesn't necessarily work or not all of the same uh, ingredients will apply to sci-fi or to romance or cowboy westerns or whatever. But it does ask a question um, and all questions psychologically need to be answered. Even if they are hypothetical ones, the brain um, seeks a resolution for them. Um, it doesn't ask what the main character it doesn't ask you know, what would um you no know, could nick connor murder his wife to save his daughter nobody knows nick connor they don't care could you do it it puts you in those shoes um so the per- use of personal pronouns really works there as well um it's domestic so it's not you know can you know, could you save the world by doing this because you know it's, it's unlikely to ever occur but the possibility of someone kidnapping a child is more realistic i mean hopefully the odds are still incredibly low but it is something that you you do worry about more than an asteroid hitting the earth for example so it it, it's something that hits home it is more domestic and is more immediately relatable um most people have got families of some sort that they can they can relate that to so there are lots of different elements to it they're just kind of three or four off the top of my mind and of course yeah, some of those don't apply to other genres, um, but they are um, things that worked for that genre and have worked since. So I had another book out uh, beginning of 2018, I think, um, called Tell Me I'm Wrong. And the tagline for that was, what if you discovered your husband was a serial killer? So again, personal pronouns, the question that he's answering, the domestic situation, um, a fear which is, you know, unlikely, but within the realms of possibility. So it's, um, it, it kind of, it followed those, um, those elements there. Uh, it's not something that I'm, I can use as well for my crime fiction or for my mysteries. Um, but for psychological thrillers, that seems to be a recipe that works for me again, for other people. Sometimes it doesn't, it's, um, as with so many things in this industry, it's, it's certainly not one size fits all. Okay. Um, that's, uh, that's intriguing. Now, I want to go back to family because you talked about family and that's <laughs> obviously in, in both those situations, both those psychological thrillers that family is there, right? Like the child, the, mm. um, the spouse, you have, uh, I, I can't even count how many books you have and published in multiple languages. Uh, what's, what's the rough count that we're at right now? In terms of number of books, yeah, I, I don't actually know. Twenty something um, in English, plus I think it's translations in Portuguese, Dutch, French, German, Italian, Korean, um, 
and possibly others that are missing. So yeah, quite, quite, quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> now I do know uh, that you recently experienced, you have a little person in your life, a, a child mm. and mm. recently experienced the um, sending that young person to preschool. Like they're actually leaving the protected comfort of, yeah. of the worlds they know. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a comparison between that and the, and, and then putting a book out into the world? Like, you know, like your baby is out there now. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, this time last week I took him in for his, uh, for his first day and um, I just went and picked him up an hour ago before we record this. Um, so yeah, very, very fresh in my mind, that one. Um, and it is a, a, a strange experience after three years of having him kind of there every day or occasionally going to my parents or my wife's parents overnight um, to kind of hand him over to a stranger that we've met once and a building we've been into once is um, a very, very odd experience. And I guess it is a bit like that with the books. Um, I, I try not to get too attached to books if I can help it. I try to see it as a commercial enterprise. That's not um, indicative of any lowering of quality or that I care any less about them, but that I try not to have an emotional attachment. I'm trying to make them as good as I can as a product and as a book, of course, so that people love them as much as they possibly can. Um, but I try not to be too emotionally attached. I try to kind of move on to the next ones where I can. Right. But there is definitely always an element of thinking what if this is the one where people find out that I'm actually not very good and I've been fluking it for 10 years and 25 <laughs> books or however many it is um and that that doesn't go away and you know what if this is the one that that flops and of course you've always got the hopes of maybe this is the next her last tomorrow or the next tell me I'm wrong so th there are both sides to that coin and you never quite know what's going to happen when you put a book out you can make your predictions and your projections and I have a rough idea of how many pre-orders I might get. But you know, once it goes out into the wider, wider world, there's never any real way of knowing what's going to happen. And there are you know, constant battles, constant challenges with new books. So can I, uh, can I probe a little bit more about a couple of things that you've said? And I've just been reading between the lines. Mm -hmm. So you, you have had a couple huge blockbusters that have just exploded. And mm -hmm. then you have had a bunch of other books that have done well, but they haven't exploded in the same way. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've had two kind of life changing books, I'd say, uh, when it comes to the, the financials, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, may, maybe could, could count three there. Um, but yeah, the majority, 90 percent of them haven't done that. Um, they've right. done well and they've earned decent money that um, you know, nobody would be turn their noses up at, I guess, but that haven't had quite the same impact. Right. So you know, I'm, I'm quite kind of candid about that, that yeah. um, yeah, I do know what it takes to make a book successful and I have done that and I have repeated that a couple of times. Um, but I also know um, the other side of things and the days of not selling books and what doesn't work as well. And some books, not the series books, they are the bread and butter. You know, they are residual income that comes in all the time. It's decent residual income. They right. keep everything stable um, in between the, the big hitters and the peaks and the troughs. So yeah, I, I, I kind of, I have fingers in all those different pies and I have experience of all of those different um, aspects of it, which um, I think is, is quite, I find it quite beneficial for me to have been able to see both sides of things. Right. Well, I mean, it also, in, in my mind, it speaks to the nature of our business, of the, mm -hmm. of the waves of different things. Some things hit and some things do okay. And some things go off the radar. Yeah. So what is it that keeps you in? I mean, obviously you're doing well. You have a lot of titles. They're all doing well. Not everyone is a, an international giant blockbuster. What are the things, how do you, when that nagging self-doubt comes in and says, oh, this book um, it didn't sell you know, a million copies like the other ones did. This one only sold whatever, even though probably the average author is going to go, wow, mm. I would kill for those numbers. Yeah. But that's still comparatively, right? comparatively the highs and lows. How do, you, how do you deal with those things? Because that's obviously got to be a tough thing, right? Because we all have that, that as you say, that self-doubt, no matter how good we're, we've done, we always mm. worry that this next book is going to be the, the one that nobody looks at. Well, I think it has to be realistic and pragmatic. And if a book doesn't hit and doesn't take off, then that's fine. Um, the next one might do. So you know, keep moving on and keep bringing them out there. Um, no book is going to sell negative numbers of copies. 
So uh, okay. every book you put out <laughs> will always help. Um, it will always move things in the right direction. It will always increase your overall income and increase the number of sources that you're getting residuals from each month and each year. Um, so releasing a book can never be a bad thing. It won't lose you money. Um, so I guess it's just a case of, of, of plodding on really. Um, and it's, it is something that I actually take comfort from that I've managed to see both sides of that. There are a number of people who have been very fortunate very early on in their career who have, um, you know, released books and it's straight away worked and they haven't had the experience of the other side of things and what doesn't work. Right. And, you know, at the point at which it stops working and it always does at some point, you don't necessarily then know how to react to that and how to deal with that and how to build things um, back again. And for me, what I try to do under my indie author mindset brand is to guide authors um, for the long term. So it's not about something which is going to make you a, a pile of money within a month or two, but it's something which is going to give you that solid foundation. So in between my big hitters, I'm still very comfortable. Um, you know, the residual income that comes from the others is still more than fine. Um, <laughs> it, it still puts me in the top 1% of authors even, even then. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with that. Um, and that's what I, where I try to want to get authors to be. So they don't have to have these big spikes and the massive highs and lows, but to at least make sure that yes, by all means have those spikes, but make sure the lows aren't that low and that you've got that solid residual income. Right. And that I'm showing people these evergreen methods, things that always work, these organic ways of building a long-term audience and making sure that things are always ticking along nicely in the background so that it, it takes that pressure off. And the pressure can be huge in this business, as, as you know. Yeah, of course, which, which is why, uh, I mean, I'm so glad. I mean, uh, you've released the Indie Author Mindset book, and then that has become an entire brand to help other authors to give to other authors and, and, and share your experience. And I want to get into that. But before we go there, I don't want to lose track of the foreign right sales. So you've, you, mm -hmm. you've got uh, uh, books in foreign languages. I do know, uh, I'm not sure how you got some of them. I did see listed uh, Kobo original. So I, I think you, you've worked with Kobo on uh, Dutch exclusives for, for that market in the Netherlands, I, I believe. Yes. Um, yeah. I, curious about um, that yeah. as well as the other uh, the other deals that you've signed or or worked on. Yeah, I mean, I, I I love working with Kobo. I never make any bones about that. It's um, how you and I first met as well, and um, yeah, great company. And they approached me to um, to translate the first three of my Night in Kobo House books into Dutch, um, mainly for. Uh, syndication through bowl.com which is a huge dutch uh, marketplace it's a dutch amazon basically and or dutch walmart and um that's it that, that was a, a a wonderful experience it's the first time those particular books have been translated um but in general i'm a i'm a big believer in foreign rights and in translations for because you really can't lose the worst that can happen is you'll get an agent or you'll seek foreign rights and translations and you won't get any deals, but right. you still haven't lost anything. That's not cost you anything. To <laughs> do that. Um, whereas if you get a deal, you might only get a small advance and something like seven or eight percent royalties on on copies sold, which might not be a lot as a translator edition. Um, but it's free money, right. and you don't have to do anything. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to translate the book into Dutch or Swedish right. or Norwegian or whatever. Um, you sit back, let somebody else do it. Okay. They send you a cover and you say, haven't got a clue what that says, but looks lovely. And <laughs> six months later it comes out and some money starts coming in. So, so is again, that, that, is there, sorry, is that something that, uh, so did you work with uh, agents? Did you work with other publishers or was any of it DIY? Um, well, it happened four different ways, actually. I had okay. um, somewhere um, they'd come to me um, directly and I used a, um, a, a specialist lawyer to look over the contracts and uh, I used the Society of Authors and Ally as well to, to look at things and make sure it was all good. Um, I had some that were sorted out by um, Amazon Crossing because I had a couple of books briefly with Thomas and Mercer. Right. And as part of that, they sorted out some... Amazon Crossing translations. I um, have an agent who I work with on some translations who tries to seek out new deals um, and who also looks at film and TV rights and things for me. So they've sorted out a couple. Um, and then there were Kobo who came to me and said, we, we want to translate these. Um, 
you know, through our own means and do it that way. So they're, they're four kind of related, but fairly distinctly different methods of doing it. So there are a number of different ways of getting those books out there. But I think for most authors, um, either seeking them out yourself, making sure you've got somebody who can look over those contracts for you and support you in that, um, or having an agent who, who will do that as well, um, are, are some very good ways of bringing in some residual income and you, you know, you really can't lose with it. It's um, not necessarily going to be hugely successful overnight. You're not guaranteed to get any deals, um, but it's potentially free money for very little work. Okay. Excellent. And, and, and that does speak very much to um, the underlying indie author mindset that you try to uh, help authors with. Can you talk a little bit about the, you know, your books in that series as well as uh, some of the courses you offer? Yeah, well, Indie Author Mindset was the first nonfiction book for writers I'd put out there, really. Um, and it was kind of trying to get across, um, I guess, my philosophy and my view on the way that the things should be done, not just for the benefit of writers now, but for the benefit of the industry as a whole and for readers moving forward and trying to make sure that we're still able to do this 20, 30 years in the future. So this is one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of being wide and not being exclusive with any retailers. Um, it also had quite a few of my you know, publishing tips and things like this, and basically what I'd learned from publishing. Um, and my, I guess, manifesto for how authors should, should do things <laughs> um, if, if they wanted to, to have a similar kind of career trajectory. Um, that then turned into people wanting to kind of get in contact with questions and things. So I launched the Indie Author Mindset Facebook group, which has now got a couple of thousand authors in, um, you know, we're kind of discussing things and helping each other out in a range of topics from, you know, brand new authors who haven't published a book, right up to the likes of Mark Dawson, Joanna Penn, um, industry professionals as well in there, people from you know, yourself, um, through work at DTD and people from Kobo and Amazon and all sorts. Um, and then I started getting asked to do a course, which was something I'd always been reluctant to do. Um, and in terms of a great big super course, I'm still not going to do, um, <laughs> because well, for two reasons, one, what a lot of people want is the kind of the Mark Dawson style, um, ads for authors course, which, you know, brilliant, highly recommended. Um, but I know how much work Mark puts into keeping everything up to date and trying to make sure the latest uh, information is there. That's not necessarily my way of doing things. I like to focus on the things that don't change as much, mainly because I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I like to look at the, the long-term organic approach. And you know, as for authors, not going to lie, set me up for that anyway. Um, but my approach is, I guess, a bit more organic. Um, not as focused on the advertising side of things. So, um, and again, creating a big super course and having to put that much time into it and detracting away from my fiction wasn't something I was that keen on doing. So I started by releasing a couple of small courses that were an hour, two hours in length, focused on a tight subject like how to write killer blurbs and hooks, um, how to use vellum, for example, um, I just had one that's just come out this week on productivity for writers and how you can get more words written in a week. So, you know, small things, um, quite specific subjects that people can pick and mix. So they're you know, 30 to $50 a time. You can just go and you can do a course on particular modules that interest you rather than a hundreds of dollars, thousands of hours super course with, with everything in there. So right. it depends which way you want to learn, really. It's, um, you know, both options are, are there for authors. Um, and it kind of goes back to that um, mantra that it's not a, a case that one size fits all. There are different ways of uh, getting to success for different authors. Some people um, will swear blind one way is the best way of doing it and others will swear the opposite. And it, you know, things like this, I guess, allow authors to, to find the path that works best for them. Okay, cool. Um, uh, I'm going to include links in the show notes to uh, in the author mindset to your books, obviously to the courses so people can check them out. Um, I believe there's going to be a discount available uh, for listeners who are interested in checking out those courses. Um, but, and yes. thank you for that. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, for the listener who is uh, not going to websites and checking links and is, you know, like I listen to a lot of podcasts and I never go to the website because I'm out jogging or I'm doing whatever. What is the one takeaway that you can share about 
the most critical thing about the indie author mindset that somebody could start, you know, for themselves today with something that they could take away and say, this is something that I think would be valuable for them. Oh, I think if I, <laughs> if I could sell it into one, which I think is probably most personal at the moment. It's to think more widely. And I, I mean that in many senses, not, you know, I'm not going to go into the whole kind of wide versus KU thing. I don't mean it in that sense, <laughs> but also in terms of thinking beyond the UK and the U S uh, UK and the U S is 5% of the world's population, 5% right. of the world's readers. Um, it's, it's not even a majority of the English speaking world. So think wider than that there are so many markets that are untapped those of us who for example do book bub ads or ams ads will know that um advertising to the us is very expensive advertising for amazon is very expensive um uk is kind of heading that way as well but there are lots of markets which people just aren't focusing on and you can be a much bigger fish in i would say a small pond but these ponds are still enormous (laughs) and growing (laughs) right Exactly. Canada is a huge market. Australia is the size of the entire of Europe. Um, now these are big countries with lots of readers. They're English speaking markets and they are largely um, non Amazon as well. So you are getting away from the, the aspects that just suck the advertising dollars like Amazon, like the US. Um, so you know, don't always assume that it's best to go for the US because everyone else is and it's best to go for the UK because everyone else is. You know, while they're all stuck in traffic on that highway, um, there is another road that goes, many other roads that go off um, in the, exactly the same direction that don't have as many cars on them. Oh, I love that. I love that. That is, thank, uh, that is fantastic. Thank you. So sort of getting closer to the, the last sort of questions. Now, you are a family man. Uh, mm-hmm. And you are helping other authors because people look at you and say, oh, my God, I want his success. How can he help me? And obviously, it's difficult for you to email everyone who, who emails you. Mm-hmm. But you are spending time helping authors, building courses. But then you're also writing. So you're kind of you're, you're balancing three major uh, aspects. How do you divide up your day to make sure that you can you know, prioritize all three of them? <laughs> With great difficulty is, okay. is the answer to that. Um, I mean, for example, yesterday I was at my desk at seven o'clock in the morning and I got out of my last meeting about half past nine in the evening. So, you know, the, the, the days are long, but I enjoy doing it. And as you say, when authors and, and readers email me, I, I reply to all of them um, you know, as long as they haven't ended up in my spam folder or something. But, uh, you know, I, I reply to everybody and I try to help everybody to the best of my ability. So um, I guess... For me, when I started out writing, that wasn't there. There was kind of me, Joe Penn and Hugh Howie kind of floating around wondering what to do. And nobody had really sort of come before us. We weren't really sure what to do. Right. Um, whereas now, the opposite is true. There's almost too much information out there. And everybody's an expert. Everybody wants to give their opinion on how they did it or how what they think is the right way. So I think trying to help people cut through that and realize there are lots of ways to success. Um, not all tips will work for everybody and that finding their own way of doing things um, whilst you know, making sure they've got a long-term career there and that the industry stays for the long term as well, I think are the things that um, mean the most to me and kind of keep me going and force me to, to spend the hours I do in this room because I, I genuinely enjoy doing what I do. Oh, that is fantastic. Adam, can you please share with uh, my listeners where they can find out more about you, check out your, your, your psychological thrillers, your, uh, your crime books, your nonfiction books, your courses? Yeah, um, my fiction website is adamcroft.net. Um, my nonfiction is indieauthormindset.com. Um, if you head over to the Indie Author Mindset Facebook group as well, that's completely free to join. Um, and as I say, a couple of thousand authors in there, all helping each other out. And that, that's where most of the action goes on. So uh, anything that's applicable to writers um, can, can always be found in there. That's where I try and base most things. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me today. That's a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. I wanted to reflect on something that Adam said, and there's so many really cool things that he said, but one of the things that kind of stuck out in my mind was no book is going to sell a negative amount of copies. And that's kind of an important thing to think about uh, as authors. We worry about imposter syndrome, which is something that uh, Adam, he didn't say it in those terms, but he talked about that 
we worry about uh, you know that next release they're going to realize and I'm, I'm an imposter and uh, I don't have talent etc but the reality is with every new release you create that residual income you talked about and so yeah you release a book maybe you get one star reviews but no book is going to sell negative copies meaning you're not going to you may have invested money in the editing and the and the cover design and the marketing but the book itself you're not going to lose money on that you're uh, you know it's probably going to sell some copies so I reflected on Rush before the interview. I'm going to reflect on Monty Python because Rush and Monty Python are two things I often reflect on. But in the life of Brian, when uh, Mr. Frisbee the Third, which is the character played by Eric Idle, at the very end of the movie says to Brian, cheer up, Brian. Um, and he says, you come from nothing. You go back to nothing. What have you lost? Nothing. And then he sings, always look on the bright side of life. But I think about it that way, is you release a book out into the world. It's not going to sell negative copies. And there's probably a chance that that book is going to resonate with some readers somewhere. So that's kind of an important thing to reflect on. That's it for the reflection. I'm going to keep it relatively short. I, I always say I'm going to keep it short and, I, and then I don't. But I'm going to do well. Did I do that? You be the judge. I mentioned that there was going to be uh, an opportunity for listeners. Well, the first thing to let you know is I'm going to link in the show notes at starkreflections.ca to the courses that Adam offers in the Indie Author Mindset um, courses. Uh, and, And these are the mini courses. There's no super course, so the prices are relatively inexpensive. But if you go to the courses and you enter the coupon code STARK, S-T-A-R-K, you can get 50% off any of those courses. But for listeners to this podcast, if you leave a comment on this episode, basically any comment on this episode, it could be something that you thought was pretty cool, or your own reflection on something that you learned from Adam, or even just just commenting on the episode, you're going to be entered in a draw. Because Adam, the generous man that he is, is offering one lucky listener to this podcast a chance to win a free course on productivity for authors. And and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to automatically enter every single patron of this podcast. Thank you, patrons. You're so awesome. In a chance to win, just for being a patron. But then also, I'm going to enter in anyone who comments on this episode by the end of the day, Eastern Standard Time, January 31st, 2020. If you leave a comment on episode 115 of the podcast, you will be entered in a chance uh, to win uh, the course on productivity for authors. So that's kind of cool because I'm really eager about you guys getting access to learning more productivity because we're early in the new year and I want to make sure you start off the new year right. So just to let you patrons know because you're so cool is any patrons at the $1 per month level are going to get a single entry. Any patrons in the $3 per month level will get two entries and any patrons at the $5 per month level will get three entries. So patrons, if you also comment, well that just gives you an additional entry. All entries will be assigned a number, and a random number generation tool will be used to pick the winner, and I'll announce the winner in a forthcoming episode, so that's kind of cool. You comment on episode 113, you get a chance to win Joanna Penn's Productivity for Authors, and you comment on episode 115, you get a chance to win a course on Productivity for Authors. Can you tell that I care about you and your productivity? Well, that's it for episode 115 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Thank you so much for hanging out with me, spending the time with me. I know your time is precious. I know you have lots of things to do, particularly writing and and, and all that stuff. But I appreciate you spending the time with me. If you found value in this episode or in other episodes of the podcast, please feel free to leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice, or better yet, please feel free to share this podcast with someone that you think would find value in it. That would mean 
so much to me. So, until episode 116 and next week, this is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre, wishing you great writing and good, stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.